The Elder Scrolls places a great emphasis on the idea of dualism and the equality of opposites. Dualism is the foundation upon which the majority of esoteric teachings are based. One example of this would be the Diedric Prince, more like Princess, Azura, the hero's guide throughout Morrowind. Azura is often seen holding a moon and star, which symbolizes that she maintains, draws power from the balance of night and day, light and dark. One glaring dualistic portrayal is Vivek, a half Chimer, a yellow skinned elven race, and half Donner, a dark skinned and red eyed race of elves, also known as Dark Elves. Hermaphrodite elf, who possess godlike powers, and I mean literally half Chimer and half Donner. Half of his body is yellow and half is grey, split right down the middle. You can see from photos of him that he is quite the dualistic specimen. He can be found during the main questline of the Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind, in his palace located within Vivek City. Lord Vivek was one of the three mortal god kings of Morrowind, alongside Sotha Seal and Almalexia. Yes, a three theism of gods, though not a trinity. Vivek is often described as being both beautiful and bloody, and having an artistic violence due to his dual nature, which has been said to give Vivek a bipolar personality. Vivek is worshipped by the Donner as a symbol of mastery, as well as duality, given his Chimer Donner complexion, hermaphroditic appearance, and sinister nature hidden behind his benevolence. Actually, he not only has hermaphroditic appearance, but was actually born one. Vivek grew up in the city of Mornhold in Restain, now present-day Morrowind, sometime during the Nordic occupation of the province in the early First Era. He was a hermaphrodite born to a Nechi man, but was orphaned at an unspecified age. He was even married to one of the Diedric princes and gave birth to their children. Another interesting characteristic of Vivek is that he lives in an essential pyramid, hovering in a meditational-like posture above a triangle for the eternity of the game of Morwind. He is quite suspect, I think. He is eerily reminiscent of the dualistic as well as hermaphroditic Baphomet, who also sits in a similar meditational position. Another prime example would be Sigorath, the infamous Prince of Madness. His motives are unknowable, and Jigalak, the prince of logical order and deduction, upholds strict order above all else. In the Oblivion DLC titled Shivering Isles, which takes place in the realm of Sigorath, the player learns that the two persons, Sigorath and Jigalak, are actually one and the same. Shivering Isles reveals that Jigalak is in fact Sigorath himself, making Sigorath the one diadric prince of both chaos and order, madness and logic. The additional content of the Shivering Isles DLC comes with a plethora of dualistic portrayals, including the entire island upon which the events take place is split in half between a dark and gloomy swamped area and a brighter and more cheery wooded area. A city titled New Seoth split right down the middle where the residents in the crummy, lower and darker side of town, titled Crucible, are always grumpy and the ones in the loftier side of town, titled Bliss, are better tempered. Even the majority of enemies found in the environment have a dualistic clone found on the opposite side of the island, which are color-coded according to the half of the island they are found on. Then you have the cosmology and creation story of Elder Scrolls, which sounds similar to other games we have come across. Anu, also known as Anu the Everything, was a primordial deity associated with the creation of Aurbis. Aurbis is the universe the Elder Scrolls game takes place in. Anu is the name of an actual pagan deity of the ancient Middle East. In Sumerian mythology, Anu was a sky god, the god of heaven, lord of constellations, king of gods, spirits and demons, and dwelt in the highest heavenly regions. It was believed that he had the power to judge those who had committed crimes, and that he had created the stars as soldiers to destroy the wicked. Sounds an awful lot like the biblical god, Yahweh. According to the book Sithis, an in-game book, Anu isn't a deity of any kind, but is rather a static force without consciousness, personality, intent or will, being immutable static light. Something cannot be created without changing the creator, and Anu is static, and does not change. It is Sithis, according to this book, that created all things. This seems to be another underhanded attack on the biblical god of creation, portrayed here as Anu. The developers seem to be appealing rather to Satan, here portrayed as Sithis as the creator of all things. Believe me now that it's death worship, 
just check this city's character out. He has heavy association with death, given that he is the deity of the Dark Brotherhood, assassins, and the Dark Brotherhood is said to be the harbingers of death. The worship of Sithis is rejected by most cultures, most likely because of his association with death. Mortals often represent Sithis as a skeletal being to signify his relationship to death. Notice also the connection made with Satan and Sithis on the in-game book cover that goes by the title Sithis, the one referenced already. The odd tree on the cover seems nearly out of place for this sinister book, till one remembers the Genesis narrative and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the very tree that Satan the serpent appeared in to tempt Eve. Notice the duality of the tree on the book's cover, hinting at good and evil. Sithis, also known as the Dread Father, is the deity representative of emptiness and the void. Technically, a void, or simply put, nothingness, is death. Death is technically just the absence of life. Not a place, or state of consciousness, or anything at all, really. It is the absence of being. The sad thing is that to collect some of the better artifacts in the game, one has to deal with this dark brotherhood, where Sithis' worship runs rampant. You will often hear its members barking, Hail Sithis, as you walk around the guild. The whole purpose behind the creation of this guild was to do the bidding of and promulgate the worship of Sithis. And so the unholy matron set her servant on his path. He would found a new organization, a guild of assassins known as the Dark Brotherhood, in service not to Mephala, but to the dread Lord Sithis. The Brotherhood's divine purpose was to serve the Dread Lord and follow his desires, which they achieved through the word of the Night Mother. The religion of the Dark Brotherhood focused on the worship of Sithis. Sithis, also known as the Dread Lord or the Dread Father, was the representation of the Void. In Oblivion, the Dark Brotherhood quest rewards are as follows. Shrouded Armor and Shrouded Hood the Dagger of Discipline, the Black Band, the Suffer Thorn Dagger, Scales of Pitiless Justice, Cruelty's Heart, Shadow Hunt, the Deceiver's Finery, Boots of Bloody Bounding, the Horse Shadow Wear, the Blade of Wu. Skyrim's Dark Brotherhood quest reward the player with these items. Shrouded Armor, Shrouded Robe, Hood and Hand Wraps, Ancient Shrouded Armor, the Blade of Wu, Wine Shear, the Horse Shadow Wear, the Summon Spectral Assassin Power, Access to Babette, the Master Trainer for Alchemy, and Nazir, the Master Trainer for Light Armor. Given the huge benefits as well as the unique and powerful items available through the Dark Brotherhood questline, nearly all players are drawn into joining this satanic cult and commissioned into becoming a murderer for the service of the evil Lord Sithis. Players are even encouraged to perform occult rites in connection with the evil guild. Sweet mother, sweet mother, send your child unto me, for the sins of the unworthy must be baptized in blood and fear. Sweet mother, sweet mother, send your child unto me, for the sins of the unworthy must be baptized in blood and fear. Sweet mother, sweet... You come at last! I knew you would! It worked! I knew you'd come! I just knew it! I did the Black Sacrament over and over with the body and the things, and then you came! An assassin from the Dark Brotherhood! Such disgusting occult practices should be appalling to a moral human being. As we will see, though, such practices are the norm for Elder Scrolls. You pledge your soul to me? Yes! You forsake the weak and pitiful Boethia? Yes! You're mine now, Locron. Oh, step back. Kill me. Oh, okay. I don't wanna die. No. No. He did. Let's search him real quick. 
Yeah, you suck. The mace of Molek Baal. I give you its true power, mortal. When your enemies lie broken and bloody before you, know that I will be watching. Many would agree that in Elder Scrolls games the best way to acquire unique and powerful equipment is to do the Daedric Shrine quests. Just what are these Daedric Shrines? Well, they are massive religious statues or idols that depict various so-called Daedra lords and are the site where religious rituals and practices are performed in honor of that particular Daedra. The player may also recognize the term Daedric from the similar title of the best standard weapon and armor set, better than most artifacts as well in the Elder Scrolls games. So then, what are these Daedra behind all the best equipment and prizes available in the Elder Scrolls games? Daedra are frequently referred to as demons, although such a label ignores the fact that not all Daedra are malevolent by nature. Daedra do wield tremendous destructive power, however, and are frequently associated with death, ruin and chaos. Amongst the majority of Tamriel's populace, the Daedra are seen as naturally evil, as many concepts of evil are directly relative to the mortal world. For example, most Daedra cause disorder and chaos, which are generally not beneficial to mortal affairs. In many provinces where the human population dominates, such as Cyrodiil, Daedra are considered outright evil, and Daedra worship is outlawed. This has not stopped cults of Daedra worship from popping up across Tamriel, and in some locations their worship is accepted, or at least tolerated. In particular, the Donner of Morrowind align themselves much more closely with the Daedric Princess, especially Azura, than with any of the other Nine Divines. That's right, the inhabitants of the Elder Scrolls world consider these Daedra to be demons. The above quote seems to be written by a Daedra apologist, however, in that he tries to lead the reader away from such a conclusion. A quick rundown of what these creatures look and act like will destroy such a ridiculous claim though. I would also quickly point out that just claiming that all the Daedra are not demons because they are not malevolent does nothing to prove the point. Actual demons are not all outright malevolent. They come as wolves in sheep's clothing and have a hidden malevolent intention, sometimes even appearing as angels of light to serve their purposes. They want to steal worship from the one and true God and lead mankind astray. That's exactly what these creatures in Elder Scrolls do, as well. Not to mention that these Daedra are the exact antithesis of the Nine Divines, which are Adre, that often aid and assist mankind in morally honorable ways. Clearly what we have here, then, is just a confused portrayal of angels and demons, Aedra and Daedra, respectively. The player, however, almost never interacts with the Aedra and is continuously drawn to the shrines of the Daedra by the treasure trove of the weapons and armor they offer. This all seems much akin to the biblical depiction of the false gods and their idols that were invoked for help with seasonal crops and prowess in battle. Some of those biblical false gods may actually even be alluded to in the pantheon of these Daedric lords. Azura seems similar to Asharach, aka Ashtart, Ashtarte, Ashtoreth and Ishtar, one of the chief false gods from the Bible. Mehrunes Dagon actually borrows the second half of his name from the ancient Mesopotamian deity called simply Dagon, who is mentioned specifically in the Bible as the god of the Philistines. Moloch Baal also seems to derive the second half of his name from a pagan deity, specifically Baal, the Canaanite deity that is mentioned probably more than any other false god in the Bible, and thus is the most thoroughly condemned. If this weren't enough, just listen to the characteristics of some of these beings. Boetia, a deity of deceit, secrecy, conspiracy, treason, and unlawful overthrow of authority. Mehrunes Dagon, the prince of destruction, violent upheaval, energy, and mortal ambition. Mephala, the prince of unknown plots and obfuscation, a master manipulator, a sewer of discord. Molag Baal, the prince of domination and spiritual enslavement, seeks to ensnare souls within his domain. 
Namira, a female deity of the ancient darkness, the patron of all things considered repulsive. Sanguine, the prince of hedonism, debauchery, and the further indulgences of one's darker nature. Vermino, a female deity of dreams and nightmares, a deliverer of evil omens and dark portents. So clearly, when the player interacts with these Daedric Shrines, what is really going on is that he is essentially doing the bidding of a demon, at least a virtual portrayal of a demon. This is still obviously spiritual idolatry to the max. As one can see, the majority of these beings are very sinister and downright evil, some even requiring human sacrificial rites of those who invoke them, and one even going as far as to command cannibalism of the player. The meal is on Namira's table. Go ahead, carve. You look so sweet. Go ahead, have the first bite. Mortal, I am Namira, the Lady of Decay. Your consumption of the blood and bile of Arke's own is pleasing to me. I give you my ring. Wear it, and when you feast on the flesh of the dead, I will grant you my power. Wallow in your wretchedness, my newest champion. I knew when you walked into the Hall of the Dead that you were special. Such activities seem morally reprehensible, even in a virtual world. And given the fact that the best items in Elder Scrolls games are either related to or attained through invocation of, as well as obedience to, these demonic beings, one can rightly see that the developers of such material are utterly depraved. The Elder Scrolls games seems like a modern way of rekindling the pagan pantheism of ancient times. Somehow though, this all seems to go completely unnoticed by most players. They don't even seem to recognize that when they run from one Daedra Shrine to the next, invoking scores of demons to attain virtual worldly powers, they are taking part in completely occultic activities and essentially bringing about a new age revitalization of ancient paganism, not a technological advancement in game. Proven the strength of your will and your tongue's gift for lies. You have shown ferocity and prowess in combat. Now the time has come for a final proving. Are you able to cast aside your honor and strike with the hidden blade? <laughs> <laughs> 